Hi, my name is Tara Wick and I am a community partner with the Colorado Trust and I would like to welcome you to the webinar Rural Economic Development with uh, Chris Markison. Um, he's with the Pueblo County Economic Development and Geographic Information Systems. This webinar is the fifth in a six-part rural development learning series which is running from January 8th to the 18th, 2018. The series is sponsored by the resident teams of Antonito, Avondale, Dove Creek, Olathe, San Luis, and Sawatch in partnership with the Colorado Nonprofit Development Center and the Colorado Trust. Each of these communities has an organized team of residents who have committed thousands of volunteer hours over the last two years to identifying and analyzing their community's most pressing issues and are developing community health equity plans to address these issues at the roots. Each resident team has identified depressed economic conditions in their rural communities as a root cause issue, one that affects children and non-college bound young people the most. Communities have recognized that depressed economic conditions are intrinsically bound with social disconnection and systems of discrimination that often play out along race and class lines. Residents know that building their power, especially the power of those most affected by the issues, to advocate for themselves and their community's future will be an important part of any solution. These webinars were designed to connect resident teams to statewide experts working on solutions to Colorado's rural economic development challenges and to inspire thinking and conversation at a local and regional level. Recordings of these webinars will be made available on the Colorado Trust website for later viewing. A number of resident teams plan to invite community residents, local elected officials, and other partners to view and discuss these webinars together. The webinars will be interpreted and the material will be translated into Spanish in the coming weeks. So now it's my pleasure to introduce you to Chris Markison. Christopher Markison serves as the Director of Economic Development and Geographic Information C Systems for Pueblo County. Chris received his BS in Landscape Architecture from Colorado State University, and he has obtained several certifications and awards. Chris works to improve Pueblo's counties, Pueblo County's econom economy through progressive economic development. He is the Vice Chair of Pueblo's Historic Preservation Committee as well. Chris also serves as on the Pueblo Economic Development Corporation Board of Directors and the Pueblo Community Health Center Board of Directors. And now, without further delay, let's begin the presentation, Rural Economic Development, Understanding Modern Economic Development Principles and Practices. Chris, welcome and thank you. Thank you, Tara, and thank you for setting this up and for having me. I'm really appreciative of the trust and uh, what your organization does in rural Colorado, and um, I'm excited to be here, so I really appreciate it. Um, a little bit of background about me. I, I live in Pueblo, Colorado, and I've lived here for about 17 years. Um, I didn't come to economic development originally uh, for that purpose, it just sort of happened how things happen in in uh, uh, rural and semi-urban Colorado. Uh, my background is really in GIS or geographic information systems, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit about that today. GIS is really uh, computerized mapping, and uh, you'll see kind of how we've built what we've been doing around GIS. Um, but as 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 many of you know. Pueblo has lagged behind the Front Range in particular, especially the Denver metro area economically for a very, very long time. Uh, we have been a steel community uh, since really forever. Uh, the smelting and manufacturing of steel products has been our really our sole basis of our economy uh, for a very, very long time. Uh, what happened in the 1980s uh, in Pueblo was the price of steel bottomed out, and uh, Pueblo was facing drastic uh, unemployment, um, sometimes upwards of over 25%. Uh, so it was a really a problem time in the community. And at the time, uh, what Pueblo decided to do was to form an economic development initiative and a group of people that were really focusing on economic development. And they literally, literally saved our economy by recruiting businesses to the community. Uh, and that the, the diversification of the economy really helped to bring unemployment rates down. Uh, so that was going pretty strong 
uh, until the 1990s and everything changed. And really what happened was the advent of the internet changed the dynamic of economic development and changed the way economies function across the globe. And Pueblo uh, has been playing catch up for a long time. We started our economic development program from Pueblo County in addition to the, the, the pre-established economic development initiative uh, that really helped to balance things out. And we believe we're making some pretty significant gains. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that and some of the things that we've learned. Um, really, if you think about economic development, we really truly believe that there is only one goal to economic development, and that is to improve the quality of life for all people who live in a community. Uh, it's a pretty basic goal. Um, and, and we do that typically through focusing on businesses and in a, in a capitalist type society, it's, it, it's the means that we, that we use to do that. Uh, and as I mentioned in the 1980s, when Pueblo was getting into this, this field of economic development and really trying to get the, its arms around how do we grow the economy, uh, it doesn't just happen on its own, um, how do we do it? And there was a traditional model, and the traditional model that is basically the norm still today, especially in larger communities, uh, is what we call the economic development recruiting model. And it's a really pretty simple model. Uh, basically, if you've got uh, facilities in your community that you believe businesses can go into uh, and you are, are, are uh, wanting to have jobs in the community, uh, Basically, communities will go out and they say to uh, the world or in, in any number of different ways, hey, guys, uh, we're a low-cost low place to do business. Come here to Pueblo, Colorado. We've got the, uh, we're a depressed community. We've got a minimal amount of economic activity, so your business can be really successful here. Uh, we don't have high wages like some of the other places in the country, our land prices are really low, our taxes are low, and we have some incentive packages that we can provide. Uh, one of the things that happened in the early 1980s in Pueblo was uh, these folks that deformed the Economic Development Initiative uh, went to the voters and asked for a half-cent sales tax, uh, which was approved and has been approved uh, all the way through today. Um, but continuously, every five years, Pueblo votes to approve the sales tax. And the sales tax basically goes to offering incentives uh, to companies to come to Pueblo. And, you know, that, that worked. It worked for quite a while. Uh, but what happened, we found in Pueblo, is that the only kinds of businesses that uh, really wanted or needed to those kinds of incentives were commodity industries. A commodity industry is really a business that literally can perform its work functions uh, anywhere in the country or anywhere on the globe. And uh, it is an interesting model. And you know, some examples of commodity industry, uh, manufacturing has long been commodity industry where you know, you, really what you need as an input are, are, are the materials and the labor to turn a material into a product. And uh, the, uh, another commodity industry that you may not think of off the top of your head is things like call centers. With the advent of the internet, uh, people speak English around the globe and uh, the commodity industries uh, are desiring to plug in people who, to do the kinds of business, to do the work of a call center um, that, uh, ordinarily could be in a, in a community in the United States. And so commodity industries, what differentiates them is that their sole focus as a business is uh, bottom line, it's profitability, and that's really it. And at all costs, uh, profit is really the motive for everything. And so the need to, is to get costs down. So let's say you're successful as a community and you have some massive incentive and you're able to lure a, a business to your town and say, uh, let them operate. Well, incentives have a, a way of timing out. They end at some point. And uh, nine times out of 10, a commodity industry, when the incentive ends, will look down the road to another less expensive place to do their business. And they're the first ones to leave as soon as the incentive ends. Um, 
and if the if the incentive is not purely the thing that they that causes them to relocate a lot of times if you're successful as a community and you actually improve the community the economics of the community uh it becomes you know their bottom line uh, isn't in the right uh, balance for them and they really do seek to relocate and most of the time and what because of the internet and the advent of the internet uh, it's now possible for those jobs to move overseas India Mexico or China or places that don't have living wages um, or have um, you know really depressed economic condition are always going to be less expensive than a place like Pueblo Colorado so in this model of incentives it's really, really difficult for rural communities and even semi-urban communities to succeed and to attract business. In fact, here's an article that I saw uh, just the other day on the Wall Street Journal uh, where it's talking about the cost of incentives to communities and that incentives, this game of chasing companies and luring them to your community and providing incentives have cost more and more and more over time. And since the 1990s, the cost of playing this game in the incentive world has tripled, more than tripled. Um, and it's also really difficult for any community to succeed in this game, especially if you're rural, because at any given time, there's only about 500 companies that are looking to relocate because of, of the cost of doing business, typically. But there are over 25,000 communities in the country that are all competing to try and land them into their own community. And so the community with the largest incentive almost always wins. Um, and this has been extremely costly for communities, not just in cobbling together funding to do these incentive packages, but also in terms of the payout, you know, what the value of that incentive is. And so if you're going to be getting, uh, you know, basically buying jobs from another community, uh, to the tune of a million dollars per job, which has uh, been, you've seen it in the news lately uh, in a variety of communities. You know, at what point does the community actually get the return on their investment? And that's a really difficult thing to answer. Um, other downsides of the traditional economic development model is that it's really expensive to chase commodity industries because they typically have a large infrastructure need. And in communities like Pueblo, it's the only places that you can put large infrastructure businesses are on the far-flung locations in the industrial parks uh, outside of town. And when you're having to build these industrial park areas, uh, it, it comes with a tremendous expense, not just the built environment expense, things like water and sewer and stormwater infrastructure, but you also have service level expenses like police and fire services that are really difficult to, for any community to absorb. And so if you're paying a tremendous amount of dollars for an incentive or you're offering free land and tax abatements for a long period of time, uh, you are actually taking a, a very large net loss on your potential revenue as a community uh, from a tax base. And so a lot of times the total cost of the incentive is really buried um, in a lot of different ways. Um, so this is an important consideration. The other thing about it is, as a rural community, do our values align with uh, making our entrances to our communities really big factory looking industrial park, tin shed type uh, buildings? Is that really what differentiates us, especially for you folks on the Western Slope where you've got uh, beautiful vistas and mountains and you know in the San Luis Valley you're surrounded by mountains is is that really what we want our community identity to be uh, so that's um, kind of the risks of this and you know Pueblo has had its own share of these things and some companies the Columbia House and UPEC and Swift and just recently Ex Express Scripts all commodity industries that were brought to Pueblo through our incentive have fallen off the cliff. They basically disappeared. They're no longer part of our economy. And it really is because of a variety of factors, but it, they're commoditized industry. Uh, we've invested heavily in them and really don't have much to show for them. And so it's been a net loss in a lot of different ways. So what do we do? How do we get beyond this traditional model of economic development? 
Well, we have drawn from a variety of different models that we've researched uh, from around the country and believe that we're making some really good gains. And the way I like to contextualize this, the, 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 how, how we were going to do things is just to imagine. Imagine that you were going out someplace into the middle of the prairie and you're going to start your own town from scratch. Well, what would you do? What were the, what were the first things that you'd do? Well, it would sure would be a lot of fun to build uh, Marcuson County uh, and have a building named after yourself and you know, build the governance structure and establish law and order uh, and go from there. Uh, that would be one method. Another method would be to build a bunch of houses. Um, build some homes. People will inevitably live in them, right? And uh, they'll uh, start a town. Um, or another option would be maybe I would start a business. Uh, well, real in reality, if you want your town to survive, you need to have some form of industry. You need to have revenue coming into the community. And so, uh, basically in order for your economy to truly exist, you need revenues coming in. And typically businesses, when they form, if you were to form a business in a, uh, an open area, um, the business, in order for it to really succeed, it would need to make use of the intrinsic natural character or the natural assets of the region. And in Pueblo, uh, you can kind of see the commodity type industry that formed initially was related to steel and steel being uh, dependent upon coal and geographic location and proximity to railroads and labor pools and water, um, all things that are intrinsic to Pueblo. And so that's how this industry sort of started. And so if we were to look at how we really make change, how economic development works, we kind of need to know this, this premise of business being the driver of things. And we need to basically understand local economies and how money sort of flows within local economies. And fundamentally, economic development in all incarnations really has some fundamental principles that you need to look at and understand. That in order for your community to succeed, you need businesses that are generating revenue and they're, they're pulling dollars into the local economy from someplace else. And we call industries that do that, that actually produce a product or a service and they export it outside of their geopolitical boundary uh, and generate revenue and bring it into the community, we call them primary industry. And primary businesses are the focus of economic development. Um, I'll ha the next slide will have a little illustration of this too. So, but the amount of revenue that you bring into your community defines your overall wealth as a community. So basically, if you've got more businesses selling to other regions throughout the country, your economy is healthier. And you can see this. You can see this in communities all over the country on, on how they thrive based upon the amount of money that they're bringing into the community. So to illustrate this, uh, if you were to take some primary employers, if you were to bring a business to your community um, that, and they're generating revenue and they're bringing it into, into town, they're a primary employer. The next step, the logical function of how the economy functions is that those folks need to live someplace. And so uh, the residential industry is a follow on to the primary employer sector. Uh, People live in houses. They also need to do other things like eat pizza and drink beer and have tacos and, you know, the really essential important things. Um, there's not much else than that, but it, 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 beer and pizza and driving motorcycles, you know, fun stuff. Um, that's what the things that make the economy go round and round. And ideally, government being the end of the food chain, so to speak, in, in the local economy, uh, where tax dollars are generated to government, and then government resupplies the services that are necessary to sustain the economy, well, police and fire and sewer and you know those kinds of functions. Um, so that's in the simplest form how dollars flow through the local economy. So if we were going to uh, affect this, if we're going to modify uh, things, if we're really going to focus on primary employers, where do we start? 
Well, if you look at the statistics of uh, how things work in the, in the country, the true sources of job growth are not in large businesses. They're fundamentally within the small businesses and the vast majority of them from year to year are somewhere between 75 to 95 percent, uh, it fluctuates, are formed by existing small businesses in communities. So we kind of looked at that number and went, well, maybe we've got it all wrong in Pueblo. You know, if we're only getting a certain very small percentage of jobs being created by luring companies to come from other communities, statistics kind of show that we're missing the boat. Uh, other parts of statistics that really caught our attention were that the vast majority of businesses in the country, 81% of them, have fewer than 10 employees. They're small businesses. Um, this information is really pretty amazing uh, to think about. You, you, you hear the stereotypical phrase that small business is the backbone of, um, of the American economy and so forth. Well, it really statistically is. Uh, and I like this statistic because it's something that I can put my finger on and say, look, this is why we're doing what we're doing. The other thing that we've learned and found is that not all businesses are the same. And some businesses are grow at a much faster rate than others. And uh, some of the things that are pretty interesting is that there are some intrinsic characteristics to certain business owners that make them more uh, uh, open to taking some risks and to investing in a big way and to, and to do something innovative or interesting. And we, we label these folks as entrepreneurial growth companies, and some folks call them gazelles. And I want to mention these guys because they, in our experience, have been the businesses, the business owners that have been able to utilize what we provide the best and uh, are, have been able to grow their businesses um, pretty rapidly. Uh, and that is interesting in a lot of different ways. Because as a community, if you're investing in economic development activity, you kind of wanted to pay back in, in your lifetime. Uh, and a way to do that is to find entrepreneurs within your own community that are um, really the most uh, well positioned to do something interesting. Uh, and so in Pueblo, we've got a variety of folks that we can kind of point to that exhibit these entrepreneurial characteristics. And uh, the one of them, uh, which I, I think is a fun story, is a coffee shop, of all things. Um, we have uh, two brothers that were uh, from the West Coast, actually. They were in Oregon. And one was in Hollywood doing some uh, promotional kinds of things and, and working on uh, special effects for movies. And the other one was in was a business major and and uh, wasn't doing terribly well and, and called his brother and said, you know what, when I grow up, now that I have my degree, I, one of the things I really want to do is I just want to run a coffee shop. And uh sounded like fun. And then, so they started uh, going around trying to figure out how they could, could make this happen. And they quickly realized that in order to have a coffee shop the way that they envisioned it, uh, they, they'd like to roast their own coffee. But coffee roasters are expensive, and they were $30,000 for a coffee roaster, and they certainly didn't have that kind of money. And so uh, the Hollywood special effects brother um, was kind of a – he's a creative fellow, and, and he said, you know what? I have an idea, and he got uh, online and ordered a bunch of IKEA mirrors and uh, glued them to, to their parents' satellite dish. And this is in Medford, Oregon. Uh, and on a sunny day, took the satellite dish out and uh, put a uh, uh, aluminum container that they, would, that they got out of the uh, ice cream uh, uh, making machine and uh, put some coffee inside of it. And all of the sunlight basically from the mirrors focused on this aluminum container. And I'll be darned if they didn't melt the aluminum container. There's a lot of heat. And so they went, aha, this is pretty interesting. And so they invented a variety of things 
um, ceramic containers, or a, a number of different things, and ended up having what you see on the screen is, is basically the Solar Roast Coffee Roaster Version 1, where they were basically roasting about a pound of coffee. Uh, turned out that in Medford, Oregon, uh, it's not sunny enough. Uh, it's not sunny enough to, to take sunshine and, and roast coffee with it uh, reliably. They could do it every now and then, but it was pretty embarrassing when they didn't have the ability to uh, provide the kind of coffee, that, the, the quantity that their customers were demanding. So they literally Googled sunshine and ended up coming to Pueblo. Uh, of all places. They looked all over the country. Uh, they really didn't like Nevada for lots of reasons. Uh, Arizona was too hot. Uh, and, and they found that there's a kayak course in downtown Pueblo and it was a beautiful place. And that's where they settled. And, you know, this is the, these entrepreneurs that it's very interesting to see that they, the values that they needed as a business and also as individuals uh, were found in this community. And so we worked with them. We worked with lots of other businesses very similar to them, other really fun and interesting stories. And we found that there were some commonalities. And these, these entrepreneurs really needed some core things. They needed some basic infrastructure. They needed the ability to get online. Uh, they needed the ability uh, to you know, produce something and ship it. So having access to uh, adequate transportation networks. Um, they needed a lot of data. They needed information that they couldn't find on their own about, I'm making something, who wants to buy it? Um, they needed the ability to ship their products. They needed the ability for people to come and find them and buy their products. Uh, they needed loans. They needed some sort of capital that they could work with for with banks. Uh, they needed employees, folks that uh, they could rely on to execute their business. They, and when inevitably it's extremely difficult for them to find the employees with the full skill set that they really needed. So they really need a training program locally that they can work with folks. Um, entrepreneurs are interesting animals and they need other entrepreneurs to talk over ideas and to basically learn from each other and say, hey, uh, how did you solve this accounting issue? Or how did you create a website? You know, stuff like that. And Really, they seek a culture where entrepreneurism is celebrated, and uh, those are the kind of, those are the things that we all identified uh, that they need. And so, our economic development model and uh, modern rural economic development models focus on these entrepreneurs and finding the ones that you already have in the community predominantly. Uh, and giving them the kinds of tools that they need to succeed in creating that entrepreneurial culture. Uh, that that model is the way that uh, entrepreneurs are able to succeed and, and move forward. And so that's what our program is about. And in a simple form, it's really about taking advantage of the intrinsic natural resources of the community, um, growing primary entrepreneurial businesses from within, and and focusing on growing our economic prosperity. And in order to do this program, this model for economic development, we looked at a variety of, of communities and a variety of models. And there are, are some programs throughout the country that do exactly this, where they really are not about luring companies to town on the auspices of cheap labor and low costs and so forth, but it really is hey, here's who we are. This is what makes our community unique. And if you are in line with that, then maybe you can be successful here. And some examples of that uh, were uh, a variety of, of places. We looked at little tiny Valley County, Nebraska, of all places. This is a community with a population of uh, 4,500 people. They made national news uh, by, this is probably 2006, uh, where they had $80 million of new investment in a very, sh about six to eight month time period, where they added 80 new jobs in a very rural community very rapidly. And uh, it, it was remarkable what kind of economic gain that had. Um, Berkeley, California, although not a small community by any means, uh, they helped a local 
uh, solar company uh, by modifying it to doing interesting things with their website and their website traffic increased a furniture manufacturer sales there by a hundred thousand dollars a year um, interesting stuff um, other things like other places like San Luis Obispo California uh, jumped from uh, a low ranking best places to work in Forbes magazine all the way to the seventh best position in one year in, in a ranking and they did that by focusing on business retention and expansion kinds of activities. So these are the things that we were looking at and going, okay, you know, we don't have much of a budget. Uh, we can't do this incentive thing. It doesn't really work for us. Um, and we, you know, are starting from basically nothing. And so some of these communities are all had things that we felt like we could potentially do. And so some commonalities amongst how these communities were doing economic development is that they really focused on three core areas uh, of economic development. And they were investing in the infrastructure and quality of life in their own community. Uh, others were focusing on providing data and information to businesses within the community. And then lastly, the common focus of all of the communities is really about uh, partnerships and, and working together um, to focus on the common goal of uh, improving the economy and, in, and improving the economic resiliency of the community. So some examples of the first section of that, investing in infrastructure and quality of life. Um, here's a picture of Crested Butte. You know, we've all been to Crested Butte. It's a beautiful community. They do things really well in Crested Butte. They run their city uh, with some good uh, savvy processes. And this is something that we as a part of county government can really get our arms around. We should do our job and do it really, really well and really try and focus on the things that matter, not just to, you know, the rules that we feel like we're, we're bound by, but we should be listening to the business community. And the business community, when they say things like, you know what, I'm sick and tired of the creek near my, nearby my business flooding uh, a couple times a year. Can't you guys do something about it? Um, uh, things like, I really need to get good internet service downtown. Can't you guys fix that and work with uh, a telecom company to make it happen? Um, I need more intelligent parking nearby so my customers can kind of come and, and visit me. You know, these types of things. Uh, and one of the things that came up in these conversations uh, that, we, that we had it, with other communities and in, our, uh, in, in Pueblo is that that intrinsic character of the community is not just about the natural resources of the community, but it's also the, the, the uh, visual appeal or the historic culture or the, the natural um, it, tendency of the community that had been developed over time and historic preservation is one of those key items. Uh, when you think about a community, it's got kind of a soul to it and the the soul going in and modifying it and, and tearing down old buildings damages it. And so reinvesting in historic preservation and making sure that the things that define your community uh, stay important is critical to economic development, which was a surprise. You know, we as a community had never really thought that way. We'd thought, ah, jobs just kind of come and go and we'll build them out at the industrial park and everything will be good. Well, people want to live and thrive in a place that they really like. And historic structures and beautiful buildings are one of the things that add, that add to that. Uh, we've also found too that, and I'll talk a little bit about this in a bit, that plans as communities that that have a path forward that really understand where they're at today where they want to go and how they're going to get there uh, and have good consolidated well thought out comprehensive plans that address all aspects of of how a city is built or uh, developed uh, are the ones that are that thrive they're the ones that people really like to live in and will 
uh, continue to reinvest in those. So that, that those were pretty interesting. So that's investing in infrastructure and quality of life. We, as a department of local government, could get our arms around this and and um, have been doing this for some time. Um, and all of these aspects of uh, what county government does is really at the core of what we do, and uh, we focus on them quite a bit. And we do that in our department, and we, we use GIS and mapping data um, extensively, and which kind of segues into what the second piece to the puzzle is, is really looking at data and uh, giving data and good market intelligence to businesses so that they can succeed. And on your screen, you've got a variety of different things. These are all products of information that my office creates regularly. Uh, and you've got a map of, of some customers, the little blue dots on the map are customers, and then you've got kind of a density of where those customers live um, as a, examples that we can show to a business and say, here's where all your customers really live. And they like you, they get you, and we can give you some breakdown on the reports on the back part of this uh, with some descriptions. And we can describe uh, who these customers really are and what, what kind of floats their boat. Why are they customers of yours uh, and not someone else's? Or uh, what, are, what are you doing correctly that allows them to really understand what you're selling? And uh, we div divide things up into uh, different customer segment types. We, we do a variety of really complicated stuff in, with GIS um, that has actually been made uh, easy for us um, because software has come a long way and things are available online. And we, we use this GIS stuff extensively for a variety of different purposes. Uh, we map customers. That's one thing that is uh, pretty simple. Uh, if, if you've ever seen or, or heard of anybody using GIS, it's all about where. If you've got a customer list from a business and you can work with them, you can basically plot those customers on a map. And uh, most businesses uh, have never done this before. Uh, but it gives you a visual identification of, aha, well, here are my customers, and here's where they're not. And that's a really interesting ability. Um, from that, you can overlay other data sets, other information that is really the core tenant of what makes GIS uh, as this tool uh, really cool. And it's basically thinking and looking at a map as if it were uh, like onion skin levels of information. And you can cobble together free data from all over the place. The census, US Census being a great uh, place where a lot of data is available online for free that you download and you just basically put it into GIS. There's a whole uh, process that you can go through by doing that. And then you overlay other information on top of it. And one, software package that we have found that we really like using because it does a lot of the work for you. In fact, it's so simple to use. Uh, you really can develop a profile of a business's customers in less than three or four minutes. Uh, is something called ESRI's Business Analyst Online. This is a free, it's, it's, it's free to try for a couple months. Um, and uh, I would say it, it, it costs about $1,000 per year. Um, so not terrible. Uh, it's doable for most local government agencies to um, subscribe to business analysts online. And what we do with that is uh, generate reports and things that turn seemingly difficult information, stuff that businesses might not have like their customer list, you know, they might be not be able to map it. Um, you were able to map them and then basically turn out a report that says, hey, your customers are uh, these three types of folks and they like these things and here's how to market to them. Pretty amazing. It's really amazing that 
there's this kind of technology exists. And what we found is that we're not the only ones doing this. Uh, you know, we thought we were pretty innovative, but you know, the Fortune 500 companies, they do this. They all do this. In fact, we found that Starbucks has a staff of over 20 some employees whose sole job it is to analyze markets and to analyze where they're going to put a new Starbucks store or where they're going to close an old one. And it's all done through this same GIS software, which is really pretty cool. Um, and so our uh, initiative was really about, well, we understand this stuff. We use GIS on a daily basis to do things like, you know, we know where our property boundaries are and we map those things out. And so we, we, we're adept at managing a digital map. Um, how can we basically turn that into an economic development initiative? And we felt, well, we could map these customers for businesses. We could answer questions for them and we can do it for free. And they've already paid our salaries through their property taxes. So why not? And it's been pretty powerful. And one example is this business. Uh, we have a business in downtown Pueblo. Uh, they're a company called Terra Jet Giclay. And Giclay is a very interesting um, process where if you're an artist and you were to paint a beautiful painting, uh, you, you could sell the, the individual painting um, and it would generate a certain amount of money, let's say $500. But if you could make prints of your painting, you might be able to sell some signed prints at, say, $100 a piece and your original piece for $500. And you maybe, maybe you'd make two or $3,000, which might get you through the month um, as an artist. And so Terra Jet Giclay, really, their process is one where they would take a really high resolution photo, uh, but in a really high quality way and then they would uh, basically turn out these prints for artists and we I just happened to stop in uh, to the Giclay place one day and noticed that on the wall uh, they had a, 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 a map of the US and they were using little stick pins and just basically every time they got an, uh, an order from somebody they would uh, put a little stick pin in the map for where they were. And it was just a curious thing that they had done just to kind of say, yeah, this is cool. Uh, folks are finding us. And so I asked, can we map your customer list? And they said, sure, that sounds like fun. And they also asked and said, you know, we really want to grow some business and we think that we're going to uh, create some postcards and we're going to send them to all the rich people in, in in surrounding Pueblo and rich people, they meant Pueblo West, which is just outside of the city limits of Pueblo. And, and you've got folks with a median household income of about $65,000. And we said, well, let's evaluate that. And so what we did is we actually mapped their customers and lo and behold, we found that the majority of their money was coming from New York, from Manhattan. And we looked at, the zip codes in Manhattan and found and colorized basically how much money that they were bringing in and identified that Pueblo West is really not their market. Uh, in fact, they had three customers from Pueblo West and I think their total sales was just in the, in the hundreds of dollars. But Manhattan, somehow people had found that this little company in Pueblo, Colorado, did such a fantastic job of doing G. Clay that it had developed a word of mouth reputation in New York City. That they were, they were the ones to go to. If you're an artist in Soho or anywhere in New York, you should send your work, your original artwork to Pueblo, Colorado. They'd photograph it, turn it into prints, and you would get some amazing stuff back. So what we ended up doing is showing to the G. Clay business look at this, something's not, you didn't probably know this, and they didn't, and they changed everything. They changed their marketing method. Uh, they started, they, they, they abandoned the postcard uh, thought process, and they went full on to, let's look at uh, advertising directly in Manhattan, 
And let's think about where do uh, artists actually live in near Manhattan? Uh, what do they do? Do they ride in taxis? Yes. Uh, do they ride the subway? Yes. And they found interesting advertising methods based upon the data uh, to uh, reach out to their target customers. And practically overnight, their business almost quadrupled, so much so that they were a little over capacity and needed to hire a bunch of people. They grew rapidly. They were you know, doing some really great things. I uh, got so busy and so excited that they sold their business. <laughs> and um, so it, it's kind of like we did a little too well there uh, with those folks, but it was a lot of fun. And it was really one of the more interesting um, projects that, we work, that we've worked on. So that's an example of leveraging data, leveraging geographic information systems um, in a way that is tangible to a business that we had in our own town that uh, we didn't really know what their business model was until we threw their data into a map and their customer data into a map, which was really pretty cool. The last component of our model is m focusing on resiliency and creating partnerships. And Pueblo has a lot of assets. And we recognized that, you know, we, we might be really good in, at, the, at Pueblo County with this GIS data, but there are a lot of other folks in the community uh, that are doing really neat things, um, whether that's the Pueblo Community College, uh, who does fantastic workforce training and can modify their training programs to meet the needs of a business very, very quickly. Um, whether it's the Pueblo Arts Alliance, uh, who has connections with all of the artists in the community and can plug them into financing through Colorado Creative Industries. Um, whether that is the Latino Chamber of Commerce in Pueblo, who has some small business support services, and they have a really neat facility with a TV screen that you can uh, stream uh, training programs in a small way uh, so that people can actually participate with, with like maybe a webcast all together in the same place. Um, any number of different entities. And we found that businesses really don't have any idea uh, what kinds of resources are available in their community or in their region. But if we can develop a network of sorts where if somebody says, just happens to, to say, you know what, I'm a business owner and I need a little help, and they reach out to the local university, to CSU Pueblo, uh, and if CSU Pueblo can't do what they need to do, if we've got a great network within the community, we can refer the business owner to each other and basically create a safety net for businesses in the region. Uh, that allow uh, somebody to ask a, a, a tough question and for them to get the answer that they need and other assistance uh, as is necessary. And what we found in working with our partners at the Pueblo Economic Development Corporation, PEDCO, these are the folks that manage this, the big incentive uh, and the traditional uh, commodity-based re uh, business recruitment model. They have agreed and recognized that, you know what, having this really fantastic network is critical, not just to the program that the county is doing, but to them as well. And we, we really agree upon one thing that I think is really pretty interesting, and in that businesses succeed uh, when you're able to reduce the risk to the business. And I'll kind of clarify that. If you are a business owner and you need to make some money, uh, you want to do that relatively quickly and with as little headache as possible because the longer it takes, uh, the more it costs you. And you, you know, there's not a limitless supply of money as a small business owner. So having things like very clear policies, um, very clear rules by which businesses should, should abide by, um, and processes, local government processes, that are efficient, uh, that are able to move quickly, and are open and honest, 
are really fundamental and that for eternity, uh, local governments and small communities have had uh, good old boy networks that if you tapped into the good old boy network, then you were able to get something done. And we found that that model uh, was not equitable, that it caused uh, some businesses to win and some businesses to lose, and not always the appropriate one, not, not, not always the business that was best poised to be successful in a competitive marketplace. And so we believe that uh, modifying our government processes to be uh, efficient and honest and open and uh, accessible to, to whomever needs them is really uh, good practice, but it's also one of our best incentives as a community to offer. So as a local government, if somebody comes in and says, hey, I uh, you know, want to sell this product, how do I get started? Uh, we've got a network of people that refer each other to the appropriate starting point. And then we have a, a, a good consolidated pra practice by which we guide businesses through the process of uh, opening a business. And I should point out too that having good government processes does not mean shortcuts. It does not mean freebies. It doesn't mean uh, that we allow businesses to do whatever they please. What we found is that if we create the rules uh, and the rules are very clear and they are uh, something that people can 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 say oh i get it i should do these things and not these things that's removing risk that's removing uh excess cost that they might be putting into uh a, a, you know investing in their business and knowing those rules up front allows them the ability to save a lot of money save a lot of time and to get things going and then what are the last things in this uh, connections and net, networking kind of component and is, is something that we've added recently to our program. And it's focusing on economic resiliency. And we recognized that when people are spending money outside of Pueblo or they're spending money in a way that the money leaves our economy, uh, it's as much of a, of a, it, uh, it's a, it's a giant problem. It actually causes a reduction of the overall wealth of the community um, tremendously. Uh, and an example of that is Walmart. Uh, we have three Walmart stores in Pueblo, uh, and we have seen a tremendous reduction of the overall uh, economic wealth of the community and we can attribute it directly to Walmart. And it is because the vast majority of the revenues that people are spending at Walmart do not stay in Pueblo County. In fact, 57% uh, or more of the, of the money that is spent at a non-local business like a Walmart uh, leaves the economy and never comes back. Whereas if you are spending money at a local business, even though it may cost a little bit more, even though it may be a little bit you know, less efficient, uh, you tend to sit, keep a tremendous amount more uh, money in the local economy where only 32% of the revenue actually leaves as opposed to over 57. Uh, and this is something that we've been focusing on. So we in Pueblo County have created a advisory group um, and we, the county commissioners, are, are, uh, they appoint people to the group uh, for a two-year term, and their advisors and their task is keep money in the local economy, and they are the bi-local advisory board. And what we've been doing with really surprising success is simply, uh, at, the, at, the, at the simplest, we do a weekly, I'm sorry, a monthly spotlight on one local business. 
and uh, bring them in front of the county commissioners, uh, get them on uh, the local TV stations, uh, do whatever it takes so that they get a little bit of free promotion. And we talk about the merits of purchasing things locally. The way that we select these businesses is that they, their employees, their friends, their neighbors, you know, someone who knows about them uh, nominates them and sends us a little, uh, a little bit of information, both through the mail or through the website. Uh, it's usually just an email that says, "Hey, I think you should you should uh, consider uh, you know, this company." And today we actually had a our monthly uh, honor, uh, honoring of a business, and we honored a business that's a plumbing and heating supply store in Pueblo of all of all things. And the collegiality, the uh, the uh, the affinity for local business is really, really strong in people. And just that constant reminder of, hey, I should think about this when I, before I spend money, um, it goes a long way. And it, it is making a difference. We're having a hard time measuring that difference because this is a really difficult thing to measure. Um, but anecdotally, from local businesses that have gotten the uh, – a little award, or they get a little certificate from the county commissioners with their signatures on it. Uh, their sales go up, and they're excited. Uh, they are uh, pleased as punch to be working uh, and being, you know, nominated. We had a picture framing business that randomly got run out of a hat last month, and uh, she had been working in Pueblo for her entire life um, in business for over 35 years had never gotten any kind of recognition of any kind. Um, and immediately, uh, just because her name was in the newspaper and she got a little bit of a kudos, uh, she has uh, orders stacked up that um, she's uh, kind of have to bring in a little help to, to get her uh, able to fulfill those orders in a quick time. Uh, so this is something that new that we're focusing on that we think is a long-term big bonus to the community and that we're going to commit to um, because it, it just makes sense. So Pueblo, we've been tracking our gains for a while. I don't quite have the 2017 numbers gained or, or, or all tabulated yet, but in a four-year period in doing this program, we've some, seen some pretty substantive gains. We've worked with about 144 businesses in that period of time. And uh, working with them, they've just by using data, by connecting to the various connections that we bring together, uh, and by addressing any infrastructure issues that they they make us aware of, uh, we've tracked 1,133 new jobs being created in in Pueblo County. Um, 404 of those were part time, but the vast majority of them were full time jobs that paid a livable wage. Uh, an average salary of these jobs is much higher than the median household income in Pueblo County, uh, which is now about $40,000. So a single salary from these jobs being over $44,000, uh, we feel that's pretty impressive and we're excited about that. Um, when you tabulate the new wages by these 1,100 new jobs, uh, it's over $122 million of new wages added to the economy. And these businesses aren't just uh, adding employees, but a lot of times they have to invest in their business to support their increased growth. Um, if they're shipping products across the country, uh, a lot of times they might need to do a new warehouse facility, um, you know, things like that. And we have seen, we've tracked and worked with these businesses uh, to and, real, and, and recognize that there have been over $325 million of new capital investments made by the businesses that we've assisted. We're pretty proud of these numbers and pretty excited at them. And granted, you know, Pueblo, Pueblo County, uh, all of our residents in our community are 160,000 people. Uh, are we really rural? Well, in the eyes of the Front Range, yes, we are. Uh, are we rural in the eyes of Olathe and Sawatch? No, we're urban in your eyes. Um, so, you know, what I'm pretty excited about in rural communities adapting the same kinds of thought process that we have is that, yes, you'll see dramatic growth. It may not be uh, 1,100 jobs, but 
gosh, in a community with 800 people, if you get 10 jobs, the, the net economic gain is dramatic. Uh, and if you, you commit to doing things on a long-term basis, uh, you'll see some really dramatic gains. Um, so with that, that is really the presentation I wanted to uh, let you all see. And um, I'm more than happy to uh, answer any questions uh, from here. Chris, thank you so much. That was very informative to me. I have a, a question for you. So there's, the resident teams that are partnering with the Colorado Trust are um, preparing plans in their communities really to focus on um, how they can improve the economic conditions in their community, especially for those who are struggling the most. I love what you said about government um, being open and accountable. There's just lots of great things that I think the resident teams could help to advocate for. They do have partnerships with their local governments or are building those partnerships um, and, and their local nonprofit community. Um, and they're getting, they're hoping to direct some investments to um, the nonprofit and government entities within their communities as they determine the best strategies and to form some strong partnerships there. Um, they can't, of course, give money directly to an entrepreneur because they're a private business, um, because of the parameters that we operate under. What are some of the mechanisms that um, communities could think about? Um, that, I don't know, you've, you've mentioned a lot of things, but maybe some concrete mechanisms that they could think about that they could invest in that would help promote entrepreneurship in their communities. Sure. Uh, you know, I'm going to go up in the slides to this um, page here that basically has the three categories of uh, what we kind of lump our, our services into. And I'll talk about each of those three. And if you had a little small amount of money, uh, what you could do. Um, investing in infrastructure and quality of life means a lot of things to a lot of communities. In working with the Avondale team, I've learned and, and know that one of the things that they're most concerned about is the ability to cross the highway safely. Uh, if you've got folks living on one side of the road and it is a challenge, uh, especially for those that might be physically impaired, to cross the street in a safe way, uh, it's going to be virtually impossible for the economics of the community to be successful. You're going to have people naturally inclined to want to get out of their home, get in their car and drive somewhere else to do their business. And how as a small community can you succeed if you can't even cross the road? So working together with other agencies who might have the ability to fix that crossing of the highway uh, is is a really important thing. And when I say highway in Avondale, it technically is four lanes of traffic driving at 45 miles an hour. Um, it's a highway. It's a it's it is definitely not a massive. It's not an interstate. It's not that volume of traffic. So things like a stop sign, uh, at its very simplest, could be the solution. Um, things like you know, putting some paint uh, on the road to define a crosswalk uh, are very low cost solution that could provide very large benefit. And really what the Avondale team ha has identified is that no one has really ever articulated that need to the county who's, or, or the, the, the CDOT, the Department of Transportation, whose job it is to maintain those roads. It's just a foregone conclusion by government that, yeah, well, you know, this is kind of a road and nobody really cares about crossing the street as a pedestrian. So that's a, a very simple example of investing in infrastructure uh, within the community. Another uh, infrastructure improvement that is a constant challenge to rural Colorado in particular is broadband internet. Uh, I've heard someone uh, one time say that in rural Colorado, our internet uh, is services provided through the barbed wire in the community. Um, I like that. It, 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 it's kind of true. Uh, we're definitely not like Metro Denver. And if we in Pueblo 
you know, 160,000 people can't get good quality internet, how can a place like like Costilla County actually get good internet? It's really, really difficult. Uh, so what we see happening in, in rural communities uh, is the community basically coming together and uh, w challenging the legislative rulings on uh, the ability for communities to invest in, in community-owned broadband infrastructure, uh, creating a ballot initiative or a tax initiative of their own that basically funds an improved cell phone tower or a fiber optic connection with one of the local internet providers in the community uh, and doing good things with that. We've seen this in a lot of different places in Colorado. I think that that's a fantastic way for rural communities to get their businesses online in a way that they can they can sell their products uh, digitally to other communities and basically turn um, a local retail business into that primary business that grows the wealth of the community. And that is a very savvy economic development initiative. Um, in terms of small dollar investments, the uh, providing this information um, is a really great alternative, great, great way to do things. And you may not know it, but many libraries have fantastic information uh, at their fingertips. And the libraries uh, can do some really amazing business research. Simply having a connection and, and getting local businesses together with a business librarian at the local or regional library uh, can modify their business plan in such a way that they can really understand, oh, okay, maybe I uh, should uh, try and that sell my product uh, by advertising it on the public radio station instead of trying to go on to do it on the, t the regional TV. Uh, and the, the data supports that decision. So that is something else. And then, like I said about the partnerships and the resiliency and things, a buy local program uh, really is something that a small rural community, because it has people that really know each other, and you, you, the education of your neighbor is a lot easier in a rural community uh, because your net economic gain, if the entire community focuses on uh, just being sure to buy whatever it might be that's available locally in the community instead of going online or to Walmart, um, will support that business. And um, an example is if maybe your community has a pharmacy, uh, if you can uh, get the word out in the community that the way to keep the pharmacy local and to provide good access to medicine and healthcare is to buy your prescription drugs, even if they're a few dollars more from your local pharmacy, will have a dramatic net economic gain and keep that business and all of the additional business that comes from that in the local economy. So that's a simple simple examples of each of those three uh, components of our economic development program. Those are excellent examples. Thank you so much. Um, Johanna has a question. She says, you mentioned that one of the elements of the modern rural economic development approach is finding entrepreneurs already in your community. What are some strategies to do that? Oh, that's a fantastic question. Um, you know, in Pueblo, it's word of mouth. <laughs> uh, we, people really don't seek out going to local government. Um, they tend to kind of go, well, you know, that's the tax man and uh, I don't really want to go there because I'm probably not paying my full taxes or I'm a little late or whatever. Um, but what we do find is that someone that we've worked with in the past um, and maybe we've helped them like the Clay business that I gave an example of, uh, they got big value um, from just working with us and sitting down and chatting. Uh, they're our biggest advocates, and people tend to say, you know what, uh, you should go talk to this guy over at Pueblo County. Um, he might be able to answer some things. And 
it's pretty luxurious. Folks tend to find us and and call us, um, in 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 a lot of different ways. And when businesses or or someone in town also says, "Hey, Chris, you know, I I met this guy uh, or this gal who's got a new business, um, and I think it's really amazing. You ought to call them." I actually just go to the business and a visit and and knock on their door and say, "What are you doing?" Um, and people really love that. Uh, it's really, really effective uh, for me to, to understand what makes that business, business unique. I budget a couple of hours because inevitably there's a story that they want to tell me about how their business operates, and why they do what they do, and how they learned their trade and so forth. Um, and then we see what tools and things that there might be that can help them. And when we've kind of made a bit of a science um, drawing from experiences from other communities about discerning what uh, an entrepreneur looks like versus sort of a, a, a status quo business owner. And there's a couple of key characteristics. Um, we find that entrepreneurs uh, are kind of spastic. They uh, are shifty. They've got a lot of energy uh, most of the time. Um, they've got um, m multiple things kind of going on all together at the same time. Um, and they all have one common uh, focus or one common attribute, and it's that they have someone else who's helping them. And the someone else who's helping them is usually somebody who is grounded and has um, so business savvy might be an accountant, someone with some experience from other businesses, things like that. And really what we look for are businesses with that combination of people um, who are have the ability and the desire to really try something bold and innovative and also somebody that kind of keeps them real uh, and make sure that their money and their planning and, and their advertising that they do or whatever uh, makes sense and there's some logic to it. And when we have somebody like that, a business like that, they're the ones that are the best able to make use of advanced information and turn their business into something completely different very, very quickly. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'll also um, just chime in. I'm by no means an economic development expert. Um, far from it. But we did have a um, webinar panelist on a couple of sessions ago, Brian Watson from um, the Proximity Co-working Spaces. And he mentioned that um, because entrepreneurs these days can be you know, a person with their laptop at home, um, and it doesn't always you know, there isn't always a storefront and you don't always know who those individual entrepreneurs might be that are operating um, sort of um, under the radar, so to speak. Um, one of the things that they recommend doing is um, in, if you wanted to if, um, explore the idea of having a, um, a co-working space or even just to try and promote a culture of um, connection among entrepreneurs to have um, meetups or get togethers um, and just be just to get people together. I think they said they do a lot of beer and pizza where they get people together. Um, sometimes they'll have little classes or forums. Um, and as people register for that event, that's one of the ways that they build a database of people who are um, working as entrepreneurs in the community. Um, so I thought that was an interesting um, mechanism or strategy to try and find those entrepreneurs that you may not know um, off the top of your head. Oh, absolutely. I think those are extremely valuable. And uh, in rural communities, we find that, you know, one way or another, word gets around if someone's doing something kind of interesting. Um, and one of the strongest things as a, as a community that we can do is to just kind of reach out, uh, ask a couple questions, um, invite them to coffee. Um, and a lot of times we'll, we will have sort of a, you know, a two or three business person uh, chat over coffee um, in, in town and just sort of talk out uh, issues. And we learn a tremendous amount about what folks are doing. And a lot of times, you're right, 
Um, people don't have physical spaces that they work out of other than home. And uh, one of the things that we are dabbling in and getting better at as a county government is uh, uh, something called search engine optimization and uh, working behind the scenes in a real geeky kind of a way to allow somebody's website to be the, one of the first things that comes up when you Google that. Um, and w w an example of that, we have a, a, a very small, it's a two person company here in Pueblo. And what they do is they take, uh, they order things uh, uh, that are like from a variety of different places and they do custom uh, printing on top of them. So if you're going to buy like a bunch of coffee cups and give them out at a conference or something, these folks are the ones that actually put that custom label on things. They're here in Pueblo. And uh, it's, you know, two women that have been uh, retired from their other jobs uh, for some time. And uh, their business that they get comes strictly from their website. That's That's all, the only way that anybody can find them. We actually found them two ways. One was sort of a word of mouth. Hey guys, you should look at this business. It's kind of interesting. It's in Pueblo. Um, and then another one uh, was we simply Googled Pueblo, Colorado and, and uh, found that there was this business that was just kind of random in, in the, in the Google uh, search engine results. So we helped them to do some interesting things with their website and we worked with their website developer uh, who's also local and and showed her some techniques that we'd learned on how to modify the back end of the website in a way that allowed Google to find it easier. And funny thing too, you know, their website uh, got a lot better um, when we modified some of the words on the website and uh, what they used. You know, instead of saying custom products labeling, uh, they used plain English words like mugs with printing or you know something simple like that on it um and uh, also making sure to include pueblo colorado in all kinds of different pages so that if anybody is in colorado or looking for something locally uh they just it it, it just comes up in the google search results so yeah um definitely connections just chatting with people playing with digital abilities, uh, the, using online tools, all of those things are, are extremely helpful and very simple um, things to do that are not dependent upon a urban infrastructure. Awesome, thank you so much, Chris. Um, so as you know, um, a lot of the people that are listening in on today's webinar are part of teams of residents um, working in their communities trying to um, come up with some meaningful solutions um, for their community's challenges and, um, and are not actually the economic development um, you know departments or whatever but they're they're seeking partnership with folks what um, advice would you give to groups of residents who might want to work effectively with their local economic development um, company corporations or departments at the county level oh that's a good question uh, you know, from all of the folks that I've worked with in a variety of parts of Colorado, um, they all say the same thing, and it's really call us, stop by, um, just give us a, a buzz. You're not ever as if you if you own a business or you know someone who owns a business uh, or is even an employee of someone else's business. Um, just giving a call to your economic development agency uh, is the entry point. It's the way that things get done. Um, here in Pueblo, this connect the, the this network of, of of folks that we've built allows us the ability to answer questions that businesses might have. Um, but at the same time, we we've developed a bit of a process where if someone is looking at doing something interesting. Uh, we can guide them down the path. And uh, let's say you've got somebody locally who wants to start a new business. Uh, we guide them to creating a business plan um, and, and kind of walk them through that either uh, here in my office or we actually bring 
them to the local small business development center who has uh, really great classes. In fact, the class that I really love that they teach is something called the leading edge program. And the leading edge program is um, classes that are once a week uh, for a couple hours a, at night. And uh, over like a 12 week period, you uh, get basically graduate with a really good business plan with input from people from all over the region into it. And you can take a business plan uh, that's really fantastic and bring it to a local bank. And sure enough, they're, they're a, a thousand times more likely to give you a loan uh, to start you know, getting things going than if you had a lousy business plan or one that you didn't really quite know how to handle it. Um, so yeah, reaching out, I think is the most critical piece to it. Um, not being afraid uh, to go and talk to your local elected official is something else that um, people are always reluctant to do, but once they do it, they never regret it. Um, and we, we all should remember that local elected officials really don't know the answers, but they really typically do know who might know the answers. They're great connectors. And they really thrive off of referring questions uh, to experts. And if there are some local experts, um, even if they're not in your own community, maybe they're you know up the road as far away as Grand Junction, if you're in, in Olathe, uh, that you, politicians tend to know lots of people and they're good connectors. Um, so definitely don't be shy about approaching them individually is the easiest way. Uh, phone calls, emails, um, we find great success in uh, politicians actually uh, reaching back out and, and saying, maybe you should talk to so-and-so and just copying them on an email. Um, that, that's a fantastic way. Awesome, that's great advice. Thank you so much for that. Um, Chris, would you be willing, um, I see you put your um, email on there, would you be willing for folks to reach out to you at a later time if they have questions that pop up or want to follow up with you on a particular point? Absolutely. Give me a buzz at whatever you, if you have any questions or if I can help, uh, you know, connect you with, your, with resources in your own community, I'm more than happy to do that. Uh, there are great networks amongst communities throughout Colorado. Um, chances are good if you know, you're in Southern Colorado, we're all kind of a big family. And, you know, whether you're all the way in, in uh, the far southwestern reaches or the southeastern reaches of Colorado, we tend to know each other. And so I'm more than happy to make connections um, and answer questions as, as people need. Fantastic. Fantastic. I, I, I'm curious to know how many um, other economic development experts around the state are um, as comfortable as you are using what was the, the ESRI GIS um, programs. I thought that was so fascinating the way you were able to find out that the printmaking company's um, market was actually Manhattan and not West Pueblo. That's just, that was a cool story. You know, it's interesting. Um, in every county in Colorado, there is somebody who's a GIS person. Uh, a lot of times they work for the city or the county. They may work for the police department. Um, that typically someone in the assessor's office is, is required to do GIS. Uh, in, in small communities, I, I find it's, it's great to just reach out to somebody who has those kinds of skills and pose a couple questions. And generally, even if it's not in their, their uh, expertise realm, they know how to find some things. GIS has gotten a lot better uh, and a lot easier to use recently. Um, and funny enough, uh, down in uh, Silverton, Colorado, uh, little bitty town, there is one woman who happens to be the assessor. She is the sole employee of the assessor's office. Uh, she is the GIS expert for the community. Uh, Kim Buck is her name. Uh, if I were down there, I'd call Kim. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, 
and and ask some questions. And um, you know, folks generally love a challenge. I find and uh, uh, give them a call, reach out, and uh, things work really really well. Um, you know, Colorado is is really uh, an interesting uh, community as a whole, and we're at rural Colorado in particular. I think really. Uh, is driven by making rural Colorado succeed. Um, a lot of times it's us versus Metro Denver. And, um, it, you know, if we can leverage whatever resources we have in our local communities, uh, we, we tend to succeed. Oh, fantastic. That's a great note to end on. Um, thank you so much, Chris, for your time. It's a wonderful presentation that you put together. Um, I'm sure we'll all get a lot out of thinking about the lessons you shared and um, sharing them back with the communities that we're working with um, and living in. So thank you again, and um, hopefully we'll, we'll be in touch. Great, I appreciate it, thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you everybody who joined over the phone. Um, we'll be in touch as well, take care, bye-bye.